So you join me at a new venue, I'm currently on the road. But we've just had Hot Chips 34. Two full days and 20 hours of live streaming on this channel, and Hot Chips is complete for another year. As there are always new people watching these videos for the first time, Hot Chips is a yearly conference that talks about the leading edge silicon without the fluff of marketing. It's an engineer's conference. Here are my key takeaways from the event, but first, let's bring in our sponsor for this episode. Well shucks, the cloud is here, but which cloud do you trust? Manage your infrastructure with Linode, the biggest independent cloud services provider. Linode offers double the database performance per dollar than the big four, and now enhances it further with new NVMe-backed block storage. Spin up a game server, website, personal VPN, or something more bespoke today with a free $100 60-day credit at linode.com slash techdeppotato. What's your minimum specification? So Hot Chips this year focused on a few key areas, GPUs and high-performance computing, chip-to-chip -chip integration, academic chips, machine learning, networking, and finally, edge and mobile processors. There were two keynotes, from Pat Gelsinger at Intel, talking about how semiconductors run the world, with a second keynote from Tesla, speaking about their dojo processor scale and ecosystem. To be honest, the biggest highlight of the show was Tesla's dojo disclosures. It'll want a video all on its own, but at, uh, but at Hot Chips, they had two 30-minute presentations, as well as an hour-long keynote, which is quite rare for anyone not named Intel. In the presentations, Tesla spoke about their new Dojo AI supercomputer, or Exapod. An Exapod is formed from 120 of Tesla's Dojo training tiles, each requiring about 15 kilowatts of power. Each training tile has 25 Dojo D1 chips, connected using chip-on wafer technology from TSMC and each chip has 354 processing cores on board. Rather than each core being a simple execution port with some memory, they are actually fully-fledged cores with four-way hyperthreading. Two threads take care of the data traffic, and two threads take care of the compute. And speaking of networking, each one of the Dojo D1 chips, remember there's 25 of those per tile, has two terabyte per second per edge to speak to other Dojo D1 chips, and each tile has 4.5 terabytes per second to speak to the rest of the network. The network is three tiles wide and as many tiles long, with each D1 on the edge connecting to two Dojo inference processors, each of which have 32 gigabytes of HBM and implement a 900 gigabyte per second of Tesla training protocol of Ethernet. That's Tesla training protocol, or TTP. I see what you did there. This is all then managed through special Dojo network interface cards connected to regular CPUs. Using the quantized BrainFloat 16 standard, Tesla is claiming one exaop of compute for a 120 tile system with 1.3 terabytes of internal SRAM and 13 terabytes of high bandwidth SRAM. If you want me to go into a lot more detail, leave a comment below and I'll get that video done. Tesla also spoke about the models they're training, a disaggregated scalable system and their software. Moving on, I should address the other keynote from Pat at Intel. To be honest, this keynote was a bit of a dud, or at least, you know, for me. Intel's upper management, especially Pat, are treading very carefully when it comes to their future, whether it's the financials, such as what happened in Q2, products such as the Arc GPUs or Sapphire Rapid CPUs, or manufacturing, such as the build-out of the new fabs to make chips. The company has been plugging an almost identical story to the one Pat presented last year as he spoke about his vision for Intel. He spoke about the need for semis, the importance of being less reliant on others, and investment in the US. The one thing that might have been new, kinda, was Intel Foundry Services being a systems foundry, which is some marketing for enabling a full stack solution for the customers from chips to SOCs to power and to packaging. He did mention an Intel Chiplet Studio Suite, which I thought was interesting, elevating the concept of rather than taking and licensing IP, customers could license the whole chips already validated in the portfolio using a universal interconnect like UCIE and Intel packaging. Essentially, the more you buy, the more you save. That's one of mine. Intel, you can have that. But he did say that a new class of electronic design automation or EDA tools would be required to make this happen. If you follow Intel closely, there wasn't anything exciting in this keynote, but I guess it was kind of nice to have it all wrapped up in one place. Unfortunately, I've heard that wrap up more than a dozen times now, and my calls with Wall Street mean that they're looking for action rather than more platitudes. Beyond the keynotes, we had some good surprising talks, definitely worth highlighting. 
First up, Light Matter, and Light Matter CEO Nicholas Harris presented their latest silicon photonics technology, which kind of blows the whole area of sil silicon photonics wide open. Again, this is something that I perhaps should portion out to another video, but the long and short of it is that silicon can only transmit data so fast with enough bandwidth. By implementing optical chip to chip connections rather than electrical, instead of that two terabytes per second limit you might end up against, by using light, you could scale to multiple terabytes per second and offer better, a better match to on silicon interconnects. Light Matter does this by using in silicon waveguides and the Light Matter Passage product, as presented, is, for lack of a better term, a big 2.5D interposer. On this interposer, a customer would put their chiplets, whether they're compute, AI, memory, or more compute, and the interposer transmits the data through light rather than through electrons. Light Matter uses a special cross reticle technology, meaning your interposer could be 48 full tiles big, basically as big as a dojo training tile. In order to go off that interposer, Passage offers fiber attach per edge chiplet up to 128 terabits per second for ultimate data center scale out. The best way to think about this, it perhaps is to imagine a standard dual socket server, but instead of you having Infinity Fabric, PCIe or QPI connecting the two, you put both of them on the interposer. The interconnection between the two chips would be wide and fast, much wider and faster than anything today, and then off-chip attachments could be made to memory, PCIe, CXL, or even to other sockets in other systems. Lightmaster says their solution can manage 700 watts of power per reticle, and their biggest 48 reticle version, the, reticle, uh, the interposer itself, only consumes 50 watts, with a 1 picojoule per bit transfer. Again, this is something I probably should do a full video on. Comments down below. In the world of HPC, the show had an interesting talk from a new entrant in the GPGPU space called Buren Technology, and they introduced the BR100 uh, GPGPU, capable of two Peter Ops of Int8 machine learning and support for CXL. The BR100 is actually a dual chip design, but unlike the MI250X from AMD, which is a dual GPU and each chip is addressed individually, Buren says their solution is shown to the system as one chip, much like the Apple M1, with a 900 gigabytes per second chip to chip internet. That's Buren. This means a standard system with eight BR100 packages has 16 GPGPUs total. And each one of those BR100 packages has 64 gigabytes of HBM2E and eight B-Link or Blink connections to allow for an all to all topology in their system with 2.3 terabytes per second bandwidth. The Harton server, working with one of the Chinese OEMs, puts eight of these in a single system using the OAM format at 550 watts each, and there will be a PCI version as well. Each chip has split into 16 vector cores and one tensor core, and the tensor core is a 2D systolic array equivalent to a 64 by 64 matrix multiply. Buren is currently working with Tencent on the Buren Super programming model, that's SUPA, and with C++ support. It's built on TSMC with a CoOS packaging that's chip on wafer and substrate, and they're targeting a 1 GHz frequency. This chip has a focus on training. And one really good unexpected talk of the show was from a company called Nodar. Nodar is normally a software company, but they're working in the field of generating 3D point clouds for use in autonomous vehicles. The concept of a 3D point cloud is similar to that of the eyes. Our eyes take one image each, and the brain works out how far things are away through depth perception and it's simply using those images and a well-trained brain to determine distances of everything that it can see. This is often called stereo vision, a left and a right, and humans have a fairly narrow angle stereo vision. There's a trade-off. The closer your eyes are together, the upper limit on how far away you can tell things can be. It's also a secondary issue. Depth perception requires those two eyes to be fairly stable, and only when you're, say, walking, running, driving, and all of that, and you've essentially trained your brain to cope with that, you can tolerate vibration between the two eyes to be accurate. Well, it turns out cars have a similar problem. You can install a stereo camera on a car and it will create a depth map or 3D point cloud based on what it can see in order to get the best data. These stereo vehicle cameras need to be as far apart as possible. This allows them to see large distances, which is important when you're traveling at 70 miles per hour or you know, perhaps more in Germany. You need to be able to see two kilometers plus, not simply 200 meters. The problem is that if you make these cameras so far apart, they are less tolerant to the bumps and judders of the vehicle. And even with the best dampen dampening and stabilization technology, what the Nodar team is doing is applying machine learning to this issue to get the right results. 
this is tougher to do than perhaps the mild level of detail I'm, I'm going into here. But the vehicle cameras themselves have six degrees of freedom, that's X, Y, Z, pitch, roll, and yaw. But each camera lens has nine more degrees of freedom. We're talking focal lengths and distortions because no two camera lenses are exactly the same. This makes the problem a 24 dimensional optimization problem. So good luck doing that with multi megapixel cameras at 30 to 90 FPS within a small power budget. Nodar says they've used datasets to solve this issue, at least at five, five frames per second for five megapixel cameras at around 50 to 100 watts using Nvidia hardware. The goal for next year is to bring that down to the 20 watt level for use in large drones or last mile delivery use cases. Those were the three main highlighted talks I want to cover, but now for some quick fire coverage. Intel also spoke about Meteor Lake, its EUV enabled and first chiplet based product. Intel actually throughout the whole presentation and uh, conference essentially started saying chiplets instead of tiles, so take of that what you will. But based on the images, it's confirmed that Intel has a base tile, a compute tile, a GPU tile, an SOC tile, and an IO tile. The base tile is passive, transferring power and data, and the chips, uh, the other tiles, are connected on top using a 2 GHz Phobros connection and a 36 micron pitch. Intel showed a diagram of the compute tile built on Intel 4 with 6 P cores and 8 E cores. On a different slide, this was presented as the mid range product, probably about 45 watts for mobile and the desktop versions will simply use longer compute tiles with more cores. During the live stream I had on this channel, I actually had a rant about this, which I should probably spin out to another video, about how Intel's chiplet strategy doesn't feel like proper chiplets. Intel were able to say that initially their chiplet design didn't clock as high as their previous monolithic designs, but over time they've improved the manufacturing so that it is expected to clock higher. With Arrow Lake, the next generation will use a similar design but with Intel 20A CPU tile and the same 36 micron Fovros pitch. The generation after that, Lunar Lake, will be on an Intel Next, 18A maybe, with a 25 micron Fovros pitch. I'm not sure if this is Fovros Omni or regular Fovros, as Intel has stated both will go down to 25 micron. Another talk worth noting is Cerebrus, and after showing their wafer scale engine now for a number of years, we actually finally went into detail about its core architecture. That wave scale engine has 850,000 cores, and would you believe it, half of that is SRAM. Each core is around 30 milliwatts, so doing the math, it's about north of 24 kilowatts per wave scale engine. Sean of Cerebrus also spoke about how their compiler maps networks to the chip, and how execution of most chips is limited to matrix matrix applications, whereas due to scale, the wave scale engine can do full vector scale compute at all blast levels. If you're into linear compute, you'll know what that means. The chip has also been used for stencil compute, and the company seems to have at least 25 paying customers they can publicly mention, and probably a few more that they can't. NVIDIA had a number of talks this year, firstly with their Orin chip enabling next generation autonomous vehicles as an upgrade to Xavier, but they also spent time talking about their new ARM-based Gray CPU. We didn't get microarchitecture details, but we did get told that with 72 cores and a custom scalable data fabric, Grace is a pure scaled up play as it embeds NVLink direct into the chip, allowing for the use in Grace plus Hopper designs connected via NV switches. Two Grace chips can be connected with a 900 gigabytes per second link and with quad socket support. Each Gray CPU can be paired with 512 gigabytes of LPDDR5X for almost 550 gigabytes per second bandwidth. In this way, Grace is designed to offer a compute partner and a memory partner capacity to Hopper, allowing for larger datasets to be trained and therefore fewer GPUs. Intel again spoke about Ponte Vecchio. Not much new here, but they did go into cache bandwidth numbers, as well as confirming that the Rambo cache that Raj talked about is essentially just a lot of extra L2 cache for the chip. The L1 and L2 cache support multiple modes, such as write through, write back, write streaming, and uncached. And one of the big targets here was supporting AI models with variable parallelism. And Intel has had a few workloads and their performance results ready to show at the conference. I should also mention that CXL was a big part of the show this year, and I expect it will be next year as well. The first tutorial session was a complete run through of CXL2 and CXL3, explaining a lot about the memory models involved and how they work. Samsung were also at the event talking about their CXL memory expander, which I've covered in the video previously. ARM also came to the show, with a talk on its Morello SoC used to validate new security designs for future silicon. ARM cited that 70% of safety issues on modern silicon chips are memory related, and this SoC implements the uh, this Morello SoC implements the Cherry architecture, added in new capabilities or metadata alongside regular data, such that normal programming operations can be verified as legal or compromised slash illegal. 
The SoC was built at 7 nanometer and runs at 2.5 gigahertz, but this chip was built more about function than performance, a proof of concept rather than development platform. Those who are using the platform, according to ARM, showcase about a 73% reduction in memory issues using this architecture at the expense of about 10% of the raw core performance. It's less than 10% if you consider the caches as well. The learnings from this platform will be implemented in future ARM chip designs. AMD was present, but didn't present anything new. One talk was on the Instinct MI200 series of Enterprise and uh, HPC GPUs, uh, and that was just a refresh of what we already know. And the talk on Ryzen 6000 mobile SoCs was also something that we'd, everything we'd seen and covered before. Though perhaps the most contentious part of the event was AMD's Ryzen 6000 Q&A, where the speaker absolutely refused to answer any questions from the audience. All the questions related to security and integration or elements such as Pluton, for whatever reason, Rather than try and state he wouldn't answer the questions, he just stated that it's outside the scope of the presentation, despite it clearly being part of one of the slides. At one point, he said something similar to, as agreed, I won't answer questions on this, to which the chair just nodded his head. I'm not sure what he agreed with, or who he agreed with, perhaps the hot chips organizers, but certainly the audience wasn't informed at all, and it's clearly a point of contention for the audience if all the questions were pivoted in that way. I'm really surprised he went into that talk with those sorts of answers to those questions. It was a really poor showing and the event suffered a little because of it. I should add in notable mention of good talks from Untether AI, who had a thousand plus RISC-V core inference chip, Ravenous, also on Silicon Photonics, and Juniper, who had chiplet switch ASICs, and they were very enjoyable to listen to. In the end, both in my thoughts and a few peers I've spoken to, this year was kind of an average year for hot chips really boosted actually by the presence of Tesla's Dojo. Normally at Hot Chips we'd have a big CPU or GPU architecture disclosure, but this year we didn't really have any of that. No server x86 CPUs, no consumer x86 CPUs or GPUs that we didn't already know about. Nvidia Grace was more of an SoC than an architecture overview, and we really missed having a big one-two punch at the event. The Intel keynote underdelivered, if I'm honest, whereas previous keynotes from the likes of TSMC or even Raj's Intel were better. Given that the cycle we're in here, with both Intel and AMD set to about set to launch their next gen CPUs soon, and all the big three launching new GPUs, I'm worried that the cycles for next year won't align either. This ultimately brings up the question: did you go to hot chips? And what do you want to see this time next year? My main specification is that I can already see one big topic worth addressing next year. There are now enough silicon photonics companies with silicon in the works that it's getting exciting. We could have a session with AR Labs, another one with Light Matter, with Light Intelligence, with Intel, um, or something along those lines would be good. Or even Global Foundry is the manufacturer for a lot of these products that aren't Intel. It's not the it, silicon photonics wouldn't be the star of the event, but it would be a good session. Perhaps we can also get some of the new ARM server chips, you know, from Ampere, Alibaba, Tencent, Amazon, in for a session as well. I wouldn't mind hearing about the Ampere, new Ampere 1, the UTN, or perhaps you know, maybe a Graviton 4, or a more detailed insight into Grace as well. There might even be a chip or two coming from others not yet announced worth sticking in there. If you are from one of those companies and you're watching, start getting the sign off for those presentations at Hot Chips 2023 today.